good afternoon. Um, my name's Nick Fuggle. I am a clinical lecturer um, at the University of Southampton and also one of the co-organizers of the Clinical AI Interest Group. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today and thank you all for taking time out from the delicious buffet outside. Um, I can def definitely recommend the, um, the truffled chicken Wellington, um, but uh, the broccoli noodles also looked quite good and I might visit those later. Um, but if you think that the buffet options out there are good, just wait to see what kind of nutritional diversity we have for you in here. It's an absolute smorgasbord of presentations on a wide range of different topics. Um, and so these are the lightning talks. Of course, lightning is, is explosive, it's, it's powerful, it's rapid, and I can't think of three more accurate adjectives to describe the talks that we're going to see today. So, with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, who is Katie Collins from the University of Cambridge, and she's going to kick us off with the important topic of uncertainty. Thank you for the kind introduction. So I'm Katie, I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge with Adrian Weller, and my goal for the talk today is to convince you that human uncertainty is valuable and important to capture and incorporate in ML systems. Now I want to start by talking about data. Now why data? Well, data is one of the key drivers of ML systems today. And when we talk about supervised learning where we have labels for our data, these labels often come from human annotators, which might be crowdsourced workers, grad students in their room, or experts like doctors or lawyers. But when uh, annotators are, are, are providing labels for the data, they usually have a set of choices for what they can, what they can label, and they need to make a choice on that uh, uh, set of labels. However, if an annotator is unsure, they rarely have any way to express this uncertainty. If a doctor doesn't know what diagnosis uh, they should give to a particular x-ray scan, they still need to give some diagnosis, and there's no way to capture and represent this uncertainty. Same with toxicology or any other field where you have annotations. So it's this question that I want to consider um, in this talk and in my work right now. And I want to start by considering a case study in a popular ML uh, benchmark data set, CIFAR-10. So you can see an image here. This is an image that uh, many popular image classification data sets are trained on and tested on. So I'll uh, open it up to if anyone can have any ideas of what is in this image. Feel free to yell out if you have any sense what this is. Pyramid? OK, interesting. So as you can see, there's a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity. This is actually a cat. Uh, and it's still hard to see, even though it's um, on a screen. So this is labeled as 100% a cat in CIFAR-10, which means that ML systems are trained to say that this is 100% a cat. Uh, but uh, if the, across many of you, you'd probably have uncertainty, and individually, you'd have uncertainty. So you wanted to ask is whether you can instead capture this uncertainty across individuals and at an individual level, and instead train ML systems on these soft labels derived from people. So there was a group from Princeton that tried to address the first question of saying, well, let's capture uh, softness and uncertainty by asking many annotators for what they say the label definitely is. So that's in, in red. Uh, they collected 50 annotations per image in CIFAR-10 and constructed a soft label in that way. However, this requires a lot of annotators. So what, uh, with Adrian Weller and Umang Bhatt, we asked is, well, if we ask uncertainty from individuals, can we converge to those kind of soft, nice, rich distributions faster? And we found that yes, and very nicely, if you then train ML systems on the labels that you get uh, kind of aggregated from individual uncertainty, you can actually improve generalization to unseen data, calibration, robustness in the models that you train on these systems. And moreover, uh, you can do so from fewer annotators. So while this is in kind of a silly image classification setting here with cats and dogs, if you imagine this in a healthcare setting, that you could get by with fewer doctors that you need to annotate, or fewer lawyers, et cetera. Uh, however, this is not a one-size-fits-all fits all salve. Uh, it takes longer to annotate with uncertainty. Um, so work that we're doing now and should be on archive later this week is looking at kind of these trade-offs and how much uncertainty, when should you elicit and uh, capture uncertainty, um, because it, you shouldn't always capture uncertainty. Um, but it can be useful in many situations. Now I'm going to uh, uh, brush through quickly two other directions that we're going now with human uncertainty. Uh, so one, you can also not just look at uncertainty over kind of classical training examples of cats, dogs, and ships, but you can also apply the same ideas and concepts to synthetic data. So here, this is actually not an image that exists out in the world. It's a combination of two different classes. And this is something that's typically done in the mix-up regularization technique, where you take, say, a cat and a ship, and you mix them in pixel space, and then you construct a label that is whatever that mixture is um, uh, uh, and, and use that instead. But what we find is that 
these labels that are typically used, so this is actually a 50% mixture of a horse and a ship, uh, but if you ask annotators, they have a lot of uncertainty over what this composition actually is, and even if you told them that this is a horse mixed with a ship, it's very unlikely that annotators would say it's a 50-50% mixture. So we're looking at instead training ML systems kind of using human uncertainty and uncertainty smooth labels instead. Um, and moreover, we don't just need to get uncertainty uh, over the data that we're using to train ML systems. We can also look at uncertainty in the feedback that we give to ML systems, so in the ways that we actually edit models. And we're just starting to do this now, and hopefully we'll have a paper on archive tomorrow actually on this, um, where you can look at models that are uh, uh, interpretable and editable. So for one case study, looking at concept-based models, which go instead from images directly to the target, go from um, uh, uh, the images to high-level concepts and then to the target, and you can then look at uncertainty in people's edits to those higher-level concepts, and what we're looking at is whether models right now can cope with uncertainty from people, and if not, how we can mitigate, um, say, by training with simulated uncertainty and how different forms of uncertainty matter in this process. Now, to, to close this, this so far has all been looking at a one-way street of looking at um, uh, human uncertainty into ML systems. But as I'm sure we'll hear a lot about at AI UK, we also want models which can express when they're unsure. Um, so what I hope to do going forward in my PhD and in, in, um, what I hope to see more research in broadly is looking at this human AI partnership of uncertainty in models and, machine, and humans and communicating that faithfully across both parties, which could require new uh, 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 work in elicitation from cognitive science and psychology as well as new ML models and techniques that can actually incorporate this uncertainty reliably, handle miscalibration from people, handle questions of scalability, even though uncertainty might take longer to elicit. So these are all questions that I hope to, to address and happy to discuss um, afterwards with anyone interested. And huge thank you to, to many awesome collaborators, um, particularly the co-authors on the papers that I've uh, mentioned here, as well as many others who I've been very grateful to, to work with um, in my uh, research journey so far. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, I'm so sorry, we don't have time for questions now, um, but please do hunt out um, the speakers today over a conference coffee and ask your questions later. Um, but we're going to move seamlessly on from uncertainty to biodiversity, so please give a huge AI welcome to Tom August from the Center of Ecology and Hydrology. Thanks very much. So I'm uh, Tom August from the UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology, and I'm going to talk to you about autonomous monitoring of biodiversity. Um, as you may know, biodiversity is in crisis. The Living Planet Inn Index, which measures populations of species around the world, has shown that since the 1970s, we've seen declines of almost 70% in these populations. That is crazy, crazy big numbers. This study uh, principally looks at uh, charismatic, larger animals that are well studied in research. So we're talking about birds, large mammals, elephants, tigers, amphibians, those sorts of things. What it doesn't cover so well are insects. And insects make up the vast majority of species on this planet. They're crucial for almost every ecosystem that exists. They're crucial for pollination. They're crucial as a food source that supports um, almost all food networks uh, on Earth. They are, as E.O. Wilson said, a famous ecologist of little things uh, that run the world. So if you want to understand more about uh, insects, how do we go about doing that? There's many traditional methods that we use that are quite time and resource intensive for going out and studying insect populations. But what we're interested in is how can we leverage AI and new hardware technologies to do this job more effectively. In many places in the world, uh, we know very little about the population trends. So this living planet index is a measure of how populations are changing over time. In many parts of the world, we know almost nothing about how populations of insects are changing, and yet they're so vital. Not only that, in many parts of the world, we don't even know what insects exist in particular cases. And beyond that, in some places, there are many, many species that are simply not even described. So it's estimated that hundreds of species are going extinct every year, which are currently unknown to science. So we don't even know what we're losing. So at UKCH, we've developed the Amy Trap. So the Amy Trap combines uh, some traditional methods um, of attracting moths with uh, some new hardware and some AI for monitoring moths uh, in high temporal, uh, high temporal resolution. So the trap has a bright UV light that sits on top. 
And this attracts moths uh, from some distance. So as you all know, moths are attracted to light. That's why they sort of bump into your kitchen window. They're particularly attracted to UV light. So this light on top is specifically designed to attract moths. They come and they land on, on this screen, as you saw in that previous video, and they, and they scuttle about. In front of the screen is a camera, and the camera's got lights around it which illuminate the, the moth so you get a nice, a nice photo, and the camera collects the image. And that's stored locally uh, on, a, on a hard drive. The whole thing is powered by batteries and solar. So this sort of system can be deployed somewhere remote for an entire field season and run completely autonomously. The AI works in a number of steps. So the first step is to detect the insects that have landed on the screen. They're not all moths, so you get some sort of wasps and grasshoppers and things like that that turn up at night. So it identifies where they are, and it tracks them as they move around the screen. So we're not going to double count something that appears in, in two consecutive images. We then use an AI to determine, is it a moth or is it a non-moth? Uh, and then we take those ones that are moths and uh, stream them down into a, a moth species classifier. Um, so here's an example of uh, what kind of result from that looks like. Uh, we get species, um, uh, species identities, and it's running at about 80% uh, accuracy at the moment. As I said, individuals can be, can be tracked around, and the data that's provided can tell us not only what, what species are there, it can tell us their relative abundance, and it can tell us how that changes through the season. So these, are, these would be indications of your species composition tells you about the quality of the habitat you're in, um, you can measure things like the impact of climate change on the emergence of different species through time. This is a, a global challenge. This isn't something that's going to be solved by one research institution in the UK. So we're also part of a big international network of researchers interested in this automated monitoring of, of insects. It includes a bunch of, of countries that are united by the colors in their flag. Um, and we together, um, we together developed the AI and the hardware that's used for, for building this system. You can find out lots more about what we're up to on wildlabs.net. Um, actually, just a great website you should visit anyway, because it has loads of uh, great kind of tech solutions to conservation problems. Together, as this community, we're trying to move forward in an open way. So the hardware that we're working on is going to be uh, published and fully open, and the AI similarly in the training data sets that we're building. Um, we're keen to build a, an inclusive uh, and resilient research community. So, uh, we run webinar series, we, we share uh, blogs about updates about our research, and we try to get as many people involved in what we're doing. And that includes um, from different parts of the world. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the research at the moment is centered in kind of Europe and North America. That's not where most biodiversity is, so we really need to do work to do more to engage people in, for example, the Global South. Um, so we've got, we've got some projects coming up in the future, uh, which will be extending our reach out to these tropical uh, locations, working with local partners, trying to solve the problems that they have uh, on the ground in terms of uh, monitoring moths. Come and chat to us on our stand in Fleming, and we can tell you more about that. And you can see one of our moth traps uh, in action. So lastly, just to point to our website to find out more information and to say thanks to my colleagues who have made this all possible. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, so we're going to move on now from moths and biodiversity to the crucial area of health equity. Um, and for that, I'd like to hand over to Ellen Coughlin, who joins us today from the Health Foundation. So a round of applause for Ellen. Thank you. I don't have any um, really pretty photographs of moths, but I do have a drawing of Michael Marmot, so feast your eyes on that. Um, so my name is Ellen, I work for the Health Foundation, but I'm sort of moonlighting this afternoon and um, with some of my time working or volunteering for Data Science for Health Equity, which is, by the end of this talk, is going to be your new favourite thing, new favourite place on the internet. Um, Data Science for Health Equity is an international community that brings together all sorts of people working in different sectors and different countries um, with the aim of advancing health equity through data science. Um, we fondly call it Dishy, so I'll refer to it as Dishy from now on. It's just a bit snappier, particularly as I've got seven minutes. Um, so why did I join Dishy, or kind of what's my story with Dishy? I joined Dishy kind of at the end of 2021. Um, it was founded around that summer, I think, by Maxine McIntosh and Brio Lehman, who are both uh, based in Oxford. And essentially, I, at the Health Foundation, work as a funder. So. Um, on the one hand, I want to learn a bit more about what interesting pe things people are doing in the data science health equity space, because that's 
where a lot of my funding is focused. Um, so I want to learn a little bit about that. I also want to collaborate with some peers and find some different projects to work on outside of the remit of my role um, because it's easier to be a bit more bold um, if you're not kind of acting specifically in your professional capacity, I think. Um, I also wanted to share some work with a bit of a broader audience and particularly not just kind of the work and the work of my award holders, but funding programs and job adverts. If I knew, if I want to kind of find clever and interesting things to fund, I've got to find clever and interesting people and their clever and interesting ideas. So I figured it was just kind of a good place for me to um, join. And I joined, I became an organizer. We have like a, a group of volunteers that are a bit more um, uh, involved and essentially we kind of try and organize different events and things, but I'll tell you what you can get out of uh, this year in a moment once I've explained to you what you're looking at. Um, this is an illustration of our launch event at the middle of 2022. Uh, so right at the top, it says genomic data diversity, infectious diseases. Those are some of the themes, uh, the themes of work that we've built the community around. Um, and we've since added things like social determinants of health uh, and data standards. Now, those themes of work generally encompass things like workshops, um, events, uh, what else, kind of collaborative projects that are focused around really um, finding impact um, in the kind of short and medium and long term. Um, to the left of that, you've got some jam jars. Those represent some challenge jams that we did around issues like uh, missing data, unintended consequences. We all kind of came together for 15, 20 minutes or so and tried to solve all the problems in the world. We might not solve them, but we certainly came up with some really good ideas that we've taken forward. Uh, below that, we've got our mascot, Michael Marmot, uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot, I think, to use his proper titles, um, who came to talk to us and gave some really interesting, if not kind of stark, uh, insights on what's happening with health equity at the moment in the UK. Um, and to the right are some more kind of quotes and ideas that, we've, um, that we surfaced during that launch event. That launch event was almost a year ago, but Dishy has kind of continued to uh, grow um, and evolve since then. So if you wanted to become part of that growing and evolving community, what you can do is attend one of these um, events. We have events every month that I tend to host, which uh, is a bit of a show and tell, really. So um, we've got Ed Humpherson, uh, that's a hybrid meeting in London and online, talking about the use and misuse of data. He's a director general for the Office of Statistical Regulation. Uh, we have Brian from the RSS talking to us about the real world data science platform at the RSS. Um, I think we've got a launch of genomic um, equity uh, organization that we're working alongside Genomics England with. There's basically a huge amount for you to get involved with. And if, there isn't, if there, there's a topic that you're really interested in that we haven't touched yet, then that's where you need to come in and start a theme and corral some people. Um, you can find us at datasciencehealthequity.com or you can follow us on Twitter at ds underscore h underscore, no, ds underscore x underscore h e. Um, and maybe next time we take a photo of us all in London having fun, you'll be there as well. I can see you're all here in person and online today, so I get that you like this sort of thing, so you'll definitely enjoy Dishy. So come along um, and, yeah, find us at our next event. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, what I just um, strongly recommend as well, the, the newsletter, is that still running? Because I, I receive that on a um, regular basis and it's an amazing synopsis of developments within the field. Um, so really strongly recommended there. Anyway, so we're moving from health equity onto multimorbidity and the um, difficult issue of long, an expanding issue in fact, of long-term conditions. Um, so I'm gonna hand over now to Sophia Batchelor um, from the Alan Turing Institute itself, um, who's going to talk to us about that. So over to you, Sophia. Hi, uh, I am Sophia. Um, I'll be talking to you about how our team is building a UK-wide network um, to drive AI, the use of AI and data science techniques to address multiple long-term conditions. So, 25% of people in the UK currently are living with multiple long-term health conditions. This is known as having multiple long-term conditions, MLTC, or sometimes known as having multimorbidity. It includes conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, dementia, Crohn's colitis and other gastric diseases, and epilepsy, and so much more. 
However, what we know is that it is an increasing prevalence in the UK. It is predicted that 68% of people over the age of 65 by the year 2035, just in 12 years' time, will have two or more diseases. Now, we may be thinking, okay, that's down the road. However, multiple long-term conditions is associated with significantly poorer health, ill health, a much poorer quality of life, and passing far before your time is up when compared to the general population. In addition to this, the majority of people living with multiple long-term conditions are actually under the age of 65. This is not just an old age um, thing we have to worry about. Then when this is combined with the fact that when people are in underserved or deprived uh, areas, multiple long-term conditions occur 10 to 15 years earlier than they otherwise would. It is an incredibly concerning piece of health science that we need to be thinking about and we need to be doing research on. But how do we actually do research on this? As I just mentioned, it's not just uh, getting your heart rate, your blood pressure. There is so much more, so many complex pieces that come into effect. We're not just looking at one condition, we're looking at many. We're looking at how the many intersect together. And we're looking at this across a UK population. So how can research be done that really addresses how to improve how, how we identify these diseases and these clusters? How can we prevent these clusters occurring? And what can we do to treat them when they already have occurred? The answer, because we're all here at IAUK, is obviously with AI. <laughs> so what our team is doing um, is part of an NIHR project called AIM, or AI for Multiple Long-Term Conditions set up with a dedicated research support facility to combine data science and advanced AI techniques with healthcare and social science expertise to work together to identify new clusters of disease and advance our understanding of how multiple long-term conditions, MLTCs, develop over someone's life course. As part of this AIM program, there are 27 university partners, 12 NHS trusts, and a multitude of charities, local government, and public organizations that all come together under seven research consortia that span the UK. Each of these consortia have a slightly different focus with our optimizing medication and looking at polypharmacy, helping to improve clinical decision-making at the point of care, or trying to understand the development of long-term conditions. This really is a multi-stakeholder project. <laughs> So how do we actually do this in practice? I've just given you a lot of numbers, but what does it look like on the ground? To support these seven research projects, the research support facility, it is in the name, is based at the Alan Turing Institute with collaborators from Swansea University and the University of Edinburgh to kind of offer this expertise in AI and data science techniques to the research teams as part of AIM. We really act as a hub in a hub and spoke model to foster collaboration and to build a community, breaking down these research silos to work on a project that is so deeply interdisciplinary. We draw on the expertise currently in the Turing Network as well as our research partners and break it down into five separate research themes. The first being reproducible, secure and interoperable infrastructure. Some of you may know about trustworthy or trusted research environments or secure research environments, as they used to be called. When we're working with health data records that span the past 46 years, we need to ensure that that data is kept private, but that we can still do research on it. And that's what theme one is really set up to do. Now, again, if you've ever built an AI model or worked with ML, or if you're in the healthcare profession, you'll know that keeping records is very, very messy. <laughs> And so doing research on those records can be incredibly difficult. So this is what theme two is. The data wranglers team, which I think is the coolest job title you possibly have, is all about wrangling these complex records together to make sense of it and do research. Theme three is about building a community across our early career researchers, delivering workshops and training so that people can network and develop into uh, scientists. Theme four is about public and patient involvement and engagement, or PPIE, as it's sometimes referred to. 
And this theme really is about addressing these health inequalities and ensuring that the research we're doing, the outputs we have, affect patient care and improve the lives of people living with multiple long-term conditions. Our final theme, theme five, is all about sustainability and legacy. We quite often here in academia know that research projects is incredible and we make these great breakthroughs in the lab and then we graduate. And then maybe our po the next postdoc picks it up. So sustainability and legacy theme is about driving forward and taking the results that we have in AIM, connecting with policymakers and ensuring that it actually translates into improved patient care. The goal of this entire project and the research support facility is to support the development of best practices, data security, reproducibility, open science, and PPIE to ensure that we have engagement from all of the researchers breaking these silos, that we can share knowledge across so many people, so many universities, so many different research projects, and ensure that, research is, that the research being done is greater than the sum of its parts. And that is the power of collaboration. We again span the entire UK, and I know that some of you in the room may be AIM researchers, so it's always great to level up to see this, but it's when we work together that we can truly make a difference to such a complex problem. I would like to thank our PI, our principal investigator, Kirsty Whitaker, and our co-investigator, Chris Holmes, as well as the entire team of people at the research support facility and all of the collaborators part of the AIM project, as well as our external advisory group and all the public contributors that has made this possible. If you would like to read more information, please head to the Turing website. We have a dedicated um, page. You can use the AI underscore MLTC hashtag if you want to get our attention on Twitter or drop us an email at aimrsf at turing.co.uk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, so we move now from um, data wranglers and multimorbidity onto agriculture and particularly crop surveillance. So um, a warm round of applause, if you will, for Chris Baker, who joins us from Rothamsted Research. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'm from Rothamsted Research. Also uh, involved in this collaboration is is Cabby, uh, out, based out in Wellingford, and uh, we're, well, from the um, out-of-budget account from Turing. So we pre greatly appreciate the funding to support that. So clearly, uh, a pipeline for extracting evidence of crop loss with scientific documents. Um, basically, there's a growing challenge of our era, you could say, um, is the demand for food, increased production of food in despite the, uh, the changes that we have from, from uh, uh, climate change. Um, and, you know, the number here is 40% of the world's crops alone are, are lost to pests. So obviously, you know, there are other, all sorts of additional sources of losses, but uh, in our case, this, the crop loss is the one we're, we're going for at the moment. Um, so the initiative, the Global Burden of Crop Loss Initiative, has existed for a, a, a good number of years now. Uh, basically, the goal is to provide an authoritative uh, evidence on the impacts and causes of, of crop loss, um, the risk factors, um, in essence, to be able to provide this baseline estimate that we're really looking for, um, and really to have an impact, to be able to have, uh, to build trust, right? Trust in the data, so we can uh, provide um, policy inputs which are, are meaningful. Okay, so our specific focus of this project was to build a, a pipeline for the extraction of uh, science, um, Sorry, I'm waiting for the photographer. <laughs> the photographer is always the one that takes the, uh, my attention. Okay, so um, the, the pipeline for extracting, you know, the, uh, the text uh, segments from, from scientific documents um, and to uh, really provide a way of querying, query capability and navigation over these large uh, networks of uh, extracted information. And we plan to do that through uh, semantic querying and knowledge graph navigation. So this is a very generic system of, overview. I just clearly, this is typically what you, you expect people to be able to be presenting when they're building a full pipeline. Uh, but we basically have um, a way of importing our documents. We have a tool that's listening. And we have a series of, of classifier for classifying sentences, uh, abstracts, and deciding what needs to be extracted 
and then having uh, a tier which enables the uh, service, the um, semantic querying and, and the graphical uh, navigation. Uh, so clearly, it's an information retrieval exercise, and you know, the, it's large volumes of, of documents that all need to be processed from all sorts of different formats, um, and that includes various things like optical character rec recognition. Um, it, it's a significant challenge. Um, but the, the, uh, the classifiers that we use, we use this ab abstract classifier, uh, it's basically uh, a, um, a, a one class SVM looking for positive examples. It's very relatively na naive in its uh, design, but it seems to work quite well, uh, F score of 0.82. Um, this, again, is all uh, pre um, predicated on uh, manually curated sets of relevant abstracts. So we had our group in Cabby is able to, has been able to scan through the literature that's pertinent to them, they being the, the, the group that's interested in the crop loss, and uh, have been able to provide us the sources of information for that purpose. Um, the sentence classifier is uh, a slightly more sophisticated approach. We're taking positive and negative examples from the same documents, uh, and we have a whole series of uh, word embeddings that we leverage as well. Our scores at the bottom there are actually not so good. It's actually more challenging to identify these, these sentences. Identifying relevant abstracts through the, is relatively easy, but the sentences or the text segments is not uh, so easy. So let's, let's take a quick look at what we're actually trying to uh, annotate or extract. So we're interested in pests, crops, location of crop loss, the impact of the loss. Right? Was it positive, negative, neutral? What is the numerical value of that loss? 10 times or uh, you know, 100, 100 uh, kilograms per hectare? What is the scale of the loss? And we want the yield mentioned as well. Uh, a key thing to, mention, to point out here also is the fact that um, not all the information is in one sentence, right? It's spread across multiple sentences. So we have this challenge of co-reference resolution, which uh, all LP, NLP people kind of are familiar with. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's another reason why uh, we, we have a lower uh, performance level. Um, but also this tagging of the documents to help so we can do the training with the machine learning techniques, um, it's very slow, right? Uh, manual tagging can take up to uh, an hour per paper. Okay, so what are we actually doing when we, in order to facilitate the extraction of the information from the sentences that we have found that are good or the text segments? So we have a, a tagging tool. We use a gate uh, from Sheffield. Um, we are able to scan the documents at w various window sizes. Um, and with, with uh, additional sets of rules, uh, we're able to identify um, text segments with up to seven specific of these entities that we care about. Like I said, pest, crop, location, impact number. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the approach for extracting the information from those relevant documents. And clearly, we like to have nice structured information where previously it was all unstructured information in different publications. So this is, this is kind of part of what we want to achieve. Uh, but the challenge is, as you can imagine, like large, very large volumes of all these documents, um, uh, you know, you're not really going to want to eyeball each of them one by one. Um, so we want to be able to do something else. We want to facilitate a semantic querying over these large quantities of information. And for this, we leverage uh, a product called Hydra, which is a, a semantic querying tool. It has um, a nice interface to it, uh, but it's primarily it's about federating query access to a, a variety of different resources, where they, where they be they literature, algorithms, online data, et cetera. Um, and it uses interoperable standards. Uh, to facilitate this ad hoc querying capability and uh, data service, uh, self-service integration. Um, so this is what the Hydra interface looks like. You have a semantic query. In essence, a Sparkle query is a semantic query, but a, a, a rendering of it that the domain experts can, are comfortable with it. This is obviously quite a naive question, get all annotated sentences from the documents, but there you go. You can download them and export them into your Excel. Um, we can get more sophisticated, the queries the, the keyword graphical composition is, is there uh, for the, for the uh, experts to be, to be comforted that they've asked the right thing. Um, and we can go, obviously, much more complex here. Underneath here, we have a terminolo terminology layer, so sort of an ontology, and that enables us to, to help uh, with the query composition. Um, again, we're able to then pull out these very much more specific pieces of information. Here, we've actually got 
the impact numbers and the impact units and the impact directions also on that. Many of these are duplicated in our test in this case. Um, and the point being is that once we have been able to extract the information and call it through this, this uh, data, data federation framework, we can also leverage other services. So in this case, location was found in sentences as well. And we can basically look up longitude and latitudes and, and put these onto a map. Right? Uh, the next layer of annotation that we're going to provide here is a normalized layer where all the units of crop loss uh, are all canonical, are all the same. And then as we plot them, we can further layer over the relative crop loss in different locations. So that's, that's kind of where we were, were going there. But there's a whole range of additional um, uh, services we can integrate with and pull in other sets of information to, to augment these, these visualizations. So beyond that, uh, there's one more layer of, of sophistication with the, um, the navigation of the information is that Rothamsted has a, developed over the last 10 years a product called a NetMiner. And this is a way of visualizing networks, pathways, uh, traits of, of different uh, plants. So we've got things, you know, things like grain weight, disease resistance, plant height. Um, and the information that we, again, we extract these sentences or events of crop loss uh, these can really also be integrated inside these graphs. So this is not just the information that we extracted. This is information from 100 open data uh, resources in life sciences that are being brought together as, a, as a one significant knowledge graph, and we're augmenting that with the text mining outputs. Right? And so when we have evidence of a crop loss in a given area, we maybe know the... the um, uh, the pest management regime in that area, we can also cross-check with uh, how well it did given the, the, um, the varieties uh, traits that are there no, known from the rest of the other sources. So that's pretty much it. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so we move on to our final talk of the lightning talks this lunchtime. Um, and we're going to move on from agriculture to contact tracing and digital twins. And so uh, would you please join me in welcoming Pratik Gupta from the University of Oxford. Hello. Hi. I'm Pratik, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford. And I'm going to talk about how we can use digital twins and AI to effectively manage a future pandemic, overcome, uh, overcoming the widespread lockdowns and overstressed healthcare system. Um, I'm going to take you through uh, the drawbacks of the current contract tracing framework, um, propose a new framework, and then uh, I'll explain how we can use digital twins and AI to make that proposal work. Okay, so here is how um, the virus evolves once it infects an individual. The y-axis here is an effective viral load it's a proxy measure to indicate the concentration of the virus at any, time in, um, at any time. It's only after a certain amount of time has passed that the symptoms appear. Um, but the virus can still spread even before the symptoms appear. And so for COVID-19, this time period, known as incubation period, is approximately five days. Now, as a computer scientist, during the pandemic, I used to think, what can be the worst case virus in which all the contact tracing applications are going to be useless? So now imagine a worst case virus which has a longer incubation period and the symptoms, when they appear, they, are, they require expert healthcare and they are present in majority of the population. Now, with longer incubation period, there will be a problem of poor memory recall, as in the infected individual will have a harder time to recall who they had contacts with. However, um, and that's, that's the reason that we need a good contact tracing application, with, and that too with a good adoption rate. But if the current contact tracing applications notify everyone to quarantine, they will lead to poor user adherence. Um, and that's why we, um, so before going there, I'll have to show you the scenarios that played out in the COVID-19 pandemic. So someone gets a test result. By the time, the virus is already in its latest stages of evolution. 
Now, with the help of contact tracing, we are able to detect the potential infection somewhat earlier. So at this point, we want to ask, are there faster signals of infection? So let's look at the symptoms. With, I know the symptoms are not going to be um, as accurate as a test result, but if you combine them with other sources of information, they can be useful. So now we ask, what about if the contact got symptom? We are able to detect the potential infection a bit earlier. Now, what if the second order got uh, symptoms even earlier? Now, you would be thinking, this is an overly simplified picture. We are not going to uh, get symptoms or the contact network in real life because of the privacy concerns. So, but what we have is the ability to send risk messages or the information between the users. For example, the current contact tracing applications will send a single bit of information to inform that you need to quarantine. But what if we use this channel to encode the risk of getting infected? And this is the idea behind the proactive contact tracing framework. On every smartphone application, there sits a risk estimation engine. It takes in the input as the symptoms or test results, individual characteristics, and risk messages from different contacts. And it outputs a discretized value of effective viral load for each day in the past. In the second step, we send that value for that day to the contacts that took place on that particular day. And in the final step, we take the current prediction and convert it into a recommendation. Now, the recommendation need not be as harsh as quarantining. It can be some behavioral recommendations to avoid unnecessary contacts. Um, now, this is how the network will look like in the PCT framework, in which the users will be contacting with each other through risk messages. Um, and it's very important to emphasize that the privacy concerns are at the center of this framework. Users' information never leaves the phone, and the risk messages themselves are composed of only two or three bits, because higher the bits, higher the risk of uh, privacy attacks. So a PCD framework in two bits will look like this, in which you have users contacting each other through risk messages, and they, they will contain the numbers between zero to three. So now at this point, we want to ask a question, how do we design these risk estimation engine? And this is where the digital twins and AI will come in place. So we build a simulator, or a digital twin, um, with the help of domain experts and observing what's happening in the real world. Uh, after that, we can come up with some rules, some rules which are interpretable by domain experts. And these were built by, with the help of epidemiologists and public health experts. And then we can infer whether these rules are gonna work in the simulator or not. So this is the first approach. Now, because we have the simulator, we also have the training data to train any AI-based model. And this is the scope of our subsequent publication. Now, here are the, some, some results from the simulator. Uh, on the left, I have the measure of public health outcome. It is measured by the number of infections since the outbreak. On the right, I have a measure for economic restrictions, which is measured by a number of agents that were quarantined. Um, the gray curve is the no tracing scenario in which a person, if they are tested positive, then they quarantine as well as their household quarantines. Now, pink one is the existing contact tracing applications. And the rest are PCT. Some are rule-based and some are AI-based. So what we see is that all contact tracing applications are going to help in reducing the virus spread. But PCT helps the most. At the same time, PCT imposes the least, uh, least restrictions. So at this point, we want to ask, how do we take this lab uh, prototype to real world? And so for this, the important thing will be to align the simulator or the digital twin with the real world and do this iteratively. Um, and the second question we want to ask is whether this is going to be safe and trustworthy. So at this point, we want to take the rule-based uh, rule PCT and gradually move towards the AI-based. Now, slides and resources and even the code for the mobile application and code for all the experiments are online. Um, now, with the help of, uh, with the experience of having digital twins and AI to solve these societal problems, 
we are now embarking on a new exciting uh, uh, issue that we have identified. And that is the lack of cooperation between nations to address climate change. And so for this, we have launched a competition in which we are asking participants to, uh, to, do AI, to, to design AI-guided negotiation protocols, which can enable nations across the globe to come across and uh, to cooperate on climate change objectives while addressing global inequality. And this idea has been termed as uh, 10 most innovative ideas of the year. I would request you to uh, check out the website. Thank you. Thank you.